I guess we're, I just realized we're about five minutes before schedule, typical, uh, typical of me. So are you ready or do you want another minute or two? Let's do it. You're good. Okay, cool. So let me introduce Mauricio. Uh, in addition to being a lovely, lovely human being, uh, Mauricio Garcia is a perfumer and certified aromatherapist based in the San Francisco Yay area. Uh, through her, <laughs> sorry. I love it. <laughs> I'm from there, you know. I can make <laughs> um, through Herbcraft Perfumery, Mauricio teaches classes and workshops on aromatherapy, perfumery, botanical folklore, and witchcraft, as well as formulates bespoke products and fragrances for individuals and indie brands. Mauricio is also co-founder of the very new and very exciting Coalition for Sustainable Perfumery, uh, and the found and a founding team member at the other new and exciting initiative out of the Bay Area, which is the Ministry of Scent. So, um, Mauricio, I'm going to kick it to you. Do you have a screen share or are you good to? Uh, no, I, unfortunately, you guys are going to have to look at me. I hope that's okay. No, that's, that's good. Got this okay, cool. Cool detour seed necklace if you don't want to look at my face. <laughs> um, wow, those talks were amazing. Thank you both. Thank you, everyone who's um, done, who's spoken today and shared their work. You guys are doing really amazing, really important things. And here I am somewhere between Harry Potter and Elvira about to talk about magic, but that's what we're going to do. Um, and I just, uh, really my goal is to present something that I actually really haven't presented before in the sense of this is more close to my personal practice than the classes that I've taught before, which are much more theoretical and conceptual. Um, but you never know what people will take away from things. And so here we go. Um, I wanted to start off by saying that I love all kinds of scent. I love the, just the benzaldehyde almond hand soaps that you find at like gas station bathrooms. And I love the like pumpkin praline bath and body works candles, but I wouldn't necessarily consider those to be particularly magical or energetic fragrances. Um, I think in order for something to be that, it has to be created with um, at least some kind of intention or purpose. Um, and I find myself, um, I also uh, have worked as a buyer at Tiger Lily Perfumery, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Everyone there is really awesome. Um, and so I've gotten the chance to experience the fragrances of all kinds of uh, artists and makers from all over the world. and people are almost always successful at communicating at least a part of what it was that they intended. And while my approach is, takes the form of this uh, traditional witchcraft and spirituality, I think that the sense of making with purpose is something that almost every one of us can relate to. So um, today, I am going to be speaking on um, the creation of magical objects. That will be the focus of my talk today. Um, the, sense, um, the sense of plants, as, as, uh, the, um, as uh, Sean said earlier today, sorry, I'm really nervous. I can't see people talk when I talk, so apologies ahead of time. Um, as Sean said, people recognize in unique plants, unique places, unique people, unique homes through these really sacred, intimate, understanding of the purpose of scent and smell. And eventually we were able to teach ourselves how to extract these scents from different plants. Um, and those scented materials eventually became the, the sacred fumes that fed and connected us to the divine, um, whether they were incenses or unguents or just flowers upon the altar. These were foods for our souls, for the divinities that we worshiped or worked with and for our communities. Um, so as my practices deepened over the years, my path became more clearly one that focused on plant spirits in the botanical world. And I was eventually drawn into the world of fragrance, which had its own kind of mysteries that I was drawn into the rabbit hole to explore by Mandy Aftel herself for a little Essence and Alchemy, which I'm sure is a door, has been a doorway for many of you. Um, and is an amazing book that I recommend you read if you haven't read it yet. Um, and so the more I explored, the more I realized that there was something in that invisible interaction between human beings and scent that I recognized. And it took me a minute, but I realized that it was manifestation. Those scents manifest things either internally or externally. You wear something, you shape your reality um, in your mind, in your, with your spirit and uh, amongst the people that you're, that you're spending time with or just in your room. 
alone. Like we all are currently probably because of the quarantine. Um, but anyway, I wondered what would happen if that magic was more, more than biochemical and cultural. What would happen if I could successfully shape and direct and give form to the spiritual forces using conventional or contemporary rather perfumery techniques? Um, what would fragrant witchcraft look like? And so the stealing of a vessel in, uh, the stealing of a spirit in a vessel by uh, means of vaporous mediums or liquid mediums are mentioned occasionally in a variety of occult texts, but the theory and the practice are very minimally documented if really they're explored all, at all. So, you know, hyper niche, that's, I guess that's what we're all here for, right? Um, and in order to understand my approach, I think it's uh, helpful to understand some of the underlying metaphysical concepts that underlie my work, which is animism. Um, and fortunately, there were some, uh, it was not directly referenced earlier today, but was definitely present in the room. Um, so animism is the understanding that everything in nature and everything be made by human hands provided that making was, took care, took attention, took intention. These things have their own spirits. Um, these can be, you know, mountains, oceans, cats, frogs, fig trees, jasmines, homes, heirlooms, or objects like temples, like statues that have emotional, cultural, and spiritual significance, um, spiritual significance, hence why the destruction of these unsavory ancestors that are currently happening are so important and relevant, and um, these things have meaning beyond what's been written, these things have have been encoded into, into ourselves. They're, you know, they're symbols and these archetypes exist within all of us. And so destroying them is a big deal. Um, but above all, recognizing that all of these things have intelligences and respecting them and revering them and learning how to work with them are all cornerstones of many spiritual systems and traditions. Um, so then what is witchcraft? Witchcraft is a different thing for many people. Um, for many contemporary witches, it's a very important reclamation. It's the taking of toxic images that have been created by society and Western culture um, uh, that, been pa that paint spirit workers, people of color, queer people, women, and other marginalized people in evil negative lights, um, reversing that and empowering those, empowering those identities, empowering yourself through those identities. Um, for others, their birthrights, their specific lineage, lineages that they inherit, um, they might be African, Latin American, European, um, really from all over the world. And still for others, the term is synonymous with contemporary neo-pagan religions. But today we are going to use a simple workable definition for witchcraft. And that will, that is that witchcraft is the application of knowledge and skill in accordance with the spiritual contracts to which you are bound. And so what does that mean? Um, the contracts in these spirits can take many forms. Um, they can be ancestors, or lost loved ones that you venerate and revere, you have altars for, just think about very regularly or pray to. Um, they might be the gods and spirits of your religion or spiritual practice. Oftentimes they are plants and planets and mythologies um, with which we share resonance and origin. Um, and so the pathway of perfumery is a branch uh, on the pathway of tradition in occult herbalism. Here we take the uh, obscure, often esoteric knowledge of a very secretive industry and perceive its origin. Uh, from the void, we draw meaning molecules. Uh, we string them together to create deeply intimate recognitions within each of us. And those can be, you know, rose, jasmine, mint, pine, salt, earth, powder, metal. These scents um, then are further woven to design impressions and messages by people we call perfumers. Um, and so like any ritual or spell, the blending of fragrant substances of power for a specific purpose is the setting of a stage with intention and, and with, that, with that purpose, aligned with that purpose. So we're aligning these forces that are outside of, our, are outside of ourselves, excuse me, orchestrating a situation in which, we, which these forces align themselves for a goal through either contract, compulsion, coercion, sacrifices, time offerings, that sort of, um, that sort of thing. And then we, when we make these magical objects that take the forms of like talismans or jewels, idols, um, we're giving the spell a shape, right? So that can, that can even take the form of a bracelet that has particular meaning to you. It's something that you have imposed so much meaning on that that object gains a personality in a way. It, you can't see it in any way, in any way that's any diff, that, that is different than what you know it as. And someone else might see the same object or have the same object, but that 
one, then that object is unique. It, it doesn't exist anywhere else. It can't exist anywhere else because you're the only you that, that is. So anyway, we're giving spell shape with our physical shape through when we utilize talis talismans or jewelry or whatever. Um, the four elements and our host spirits are present on the altar, the cauldron that represents the womb of the earth, the candle that brights hot, that burns brightly, mirrors, waters, flower, whatever other things give your shape work. And the object that we're, this magical object that we're enchanting, say, we're, say it's gonna be this, bra this bracelet, um, it's charged, it's blessed, it's enchanted, whatever word you prefer um, to use for those things. They're anointed with waters and oils and powders that have been prepared ahead of time, have their own purpose and things um, that are made with all these objects are made into a new thing. Um, so how do we do that with perfume? Um, I think that because most of you work with fragrance, you can understand how we take these, these unique little bits of things, whether they're whole oils or individual molecules, and put them together in ways that are sometimes simple, but very often very complex, and make something completely new. And that is, I, I believe, why we think of fragrance as, a, as an alchemical process. The creation of fragrance is an alchemical process. Um, what, whether it's, you know, uh, the pumpkin praline candle that I love so much, probably too much, at Bath and Body Works, or a complete unique fragrance that only exists for a single person that you've done, you know, you've made it for as a gift, or, or maybe that fragrance reminds you of someone always. Those objects, those, we can construct vessels with fragrance, fragrant materials. Um, and so how do we then conjure the forces that I mentioned earlier, whatever they are, ancestors, gods, spirits, well, they can be done through, this can be done through botanical extracts, essential oils, absolutes, tinctures. Um, in, my, in my classes, we usually talk about how we use these extracts to conjure the geniuses and energies of sometimes entire botanical species or the energies of individual, individual plants um, that say a tincture was made. You, you grow a Brugmansia and you want to tincture it. And that was probably a really bad plant to recommend because it's really poisonous. Don't do that. Don't drink it. Don't, unless you're, you, you know, Unless there's, you're working within a tradition that does that. I'll say that. Um, so, you know, we have rose, we have jasmine, mugwort, wormwood. These are all plants that have deep, deep associations for each of us. Um, I, if I start talking about what rose does, what mugwort does, what wormwood does, I will talk forever. So please feel free to ask questions if there's like a particular plant or set of plants that you're interested in knowing what some of their folklore, or at least my personal application for them might be. Um, Cypress is a really, uh, really wonderful one that um, grows locally here, and um, I think it's not an ingredient that I see too much, but is a really, really powerful plant um, for working with the dead and for all, really all of the rites um, of passing um, of someone moving into the, into the next world. I will um, touch on Lily, um, just because I always, I think I've talked about Lily in, about all the time, but Lily's a really, really cool flower, not only because it smells beautiful and is also poisonous, um, but because um, Christian lore says that when the lily, uh, when Christ woke through the gar walked through the Garden of Agony, all of the flowers bowed in reverence except for the lily because she was too proud. And so she was cursed. And that flower now is said to be sacred to Lilith, which is the spirit mother of witches and sorceries and, and sorcerer and was the first Eve um, there was a second Eve because she didn't want to do what she was told. Um, and so she is a very exalted figure um, in witchcraft for very for obvious reasons. Aconite actually has a similar story, which is really cool. Um, the devil came up to poison all the flowers with his glare because he hated how beautiful they were. And so God blew a wind to make all the flowers bow so that his gaze couldn't land upon them. And Aconite, also known as monk's hood and wolfsbane, uh, refused to bow, and to this day, it is still one of the most poisonous plants that we um, that we know. And so, the reason I'm talking about these is: Do I believe the rebellion against that god gave them their power? No, but it's really interesting that people would recognize their natures during. They're especially written about during these ages when the authority of their religion was so absolute, when all power but that of their god was evil, and the flowers still refuse to lessen themselves in order to accommodate that worldview. They're haunted, they're cursed. These people are able to recognize plants that in traditional witchcraft we actually consider to be witch plants, to be witches them, themselves. They recognize these plants of power and built these folklores around them to demonize them, to paint them as evil, to paint them as negative. Um, 
And so what we then, what we can do when we're creating fragrance is taking the lily note, this lily, this lily note that can range from, you know, green to luscious to stargazer lily to indolic, whatever it is that you want to make it, but choosing which of those lilies is most appropriate, not necessarily for the products, that, the fragrance that you're conceiving of, but for the purpose and intention of the scent. So um, that can take the form of fog. I have a really fun fog accord that um, takes a bunch of floralizers and aquatic materials and uses a little pinch of onicha, which is roasted seashells, to bring forth this really oceanic scent because I grew up in fog. Um, I'm from South San Francisco and now there's not so much fog anymore because of global warming, which really sucks. But fog is in my blood. And so this is a really, really fun material for me to work with because when I'm trying to create a fragrance either that reminds me of the coast or or that is somehow concealing or is revealing in a different way, I can use this fog accord and string it through my fragrance and it can be a big part of it, it can be a small part of it. There are ways of designing a scent utilizing intentionally created materials um, or intentionally sourced materials that I think adds a new dimension to fragrance. And so then these, these are blended together and they turn into these liquid spells, they turn into vessels that allow you to reshape someone's, reshape someone's world, reshape someone's reality, excuse me. So for this talk, I asked myself, how is this relevant to the extreme situation that we are in now? Um, how, how do I connect this to these really radical, necessarily transformative times that are ripe with change? Well, we like to say that fragrance was used to commune with the divine through smoke, incense, etc. Um, and as we've discussed today, we can still use these materials to connect to spirits and places. Um, but what is it that they're telling us? What is the earth from which all things come saying? Um, and I believe that it is saying that we are, and not only I believe, but many other people believe that we're in the twilight of an age. This is a time of really intense transformation. And at the beginning of the US's lackluster quarantine um, that was designed to, designed to protect our communities from the novel coronavirus, I found myself diving headfirst into a fragrance that I'd been wanting to make for years and I just, it just never happened. I never sat down to do it. And that fragrance was, is named Ofrenda. Um, it has notes of tequila, simpasuchi, tuberose, mole spices, cacao, candle wax, all these different materials that, um, were, are, that are used to honor our ancestors, to conjure that golden light on the altar during Halloween and Dia de los Muertos. And why did I, why was it at this time that I felt compelled to make this fragrance? And I do believe that the ancestors are calling us, all of our ancestors are calling us to honor their wounds and their victories and reminding us that their struggles, we've inherited their struggles. Their struggles are not over and they're far from over. Um, their children's children have inherited their pains and their oppressions and we, but we've also inherited their dreams of a future in which all people may thrive. And so I do believe that it is our responsibility to use whatever tools and platforms we have available to us to remind us that we hold we hold the clay of the future in our hands. And it's, it sounds like everyone's thinking about this and trying to weave their work, weave their work through this movement rather than move, weaving the movement through their work. And I think that's really important. Um, and that brings me actually to sustainability. Um, so honoring the planet means protecting the planet, right? The heart of my work is the natural world. And so I have to look at the ripples of my actions and understand how far they reach. So, um, for Herbcraft, I've committed to not utilizing extracts from endangered and threatened species until I'm able to verify that their sources are sustainable, renewable, and ethical. But how do I know that the information I'm receiving is true? How do I know that it's not just kind of some randomly generated certificate? Um, or, you know, what happens when I ask a supplier and they're like, here's the certificate of analysis. And I'm like, that doesn't tell me anything about its sustainability. Um, so. So I understand that not using these materials um, is not the way of rescuing them. We have, there are so many people that depend on a lot of these endangered uh, materials, harvesting these endangered materials to survive. So then we have to ask ourselves, how have colonialism and global capitalism contributed to the oppression and exploitation of these people? How do we remedy this? How do we contribute to this? I think is the most important question for those of us in the Western world to ask ourselves. 
Um, and those questions are uh, essentially why I co-founded the Coalition of Sustainable Perfumery. Um, I co-founded that with uh, Heather D'Angelo of Carta Fragrances, Molly Brennan of House of Sacred Scents, and Sydney Buffman of Sid Botanica. And through the CSP, we're networking and fostering, converse, networking and fostering conversations with uh, industry professionals, ecologists, people from fragrance houses, chemists and green chemists, uh, supply chain experts and perfumers as well, um, in order to figure out how we can make fragrance sustainable. It's not so, I, it, in my opinion, it's not so much about as sustainable as possible. I think that is this road that we're walking that is very important to walk. But ultimately, how can we create an industry that is sustainable, that renews itself, that not only renews what it uses, but also renews the plants that have been destroyed and stripped down because of it in the communities that have been harmed due to you know, hundreds of years of oppression, um, thanks to the spice trades and such. So um, in closing, the path of witchcraft is an undeniable bone deep calling from beyond the thresholds of our world. Darkness between trees, from the moon, from pictures of your ancestors, from visiting their graves, from your memories. As such, the witch is a cultural, as a cultural construction is the abjuration, the rejection of a world that doesn't know the value of human liberation and freedom and connection with the natural world um, that exists beyond culture that is in a, a lot of ways singular, but also identical to those that are possible within all the people that are around us. Black lives have obviously always held immeasurable, well, not so obviously, I suppose, held immeasurable value. And I think that our reckoning with that denial has, is long overdue. Um, I think that it's not only our responsibility to understand how racism shapes our industries, whether that's in the represent representation of perfumers, per people who don't even know that fragrance is a career path, um, or the, uh, those victims of global capitalism that harvest these things that we use just dropping into alcohol as if it's nothing. And you know, there's no frankincense that is created without conflict. Everywhere that frankincense comes from, there's suffering. And that's such a sacred, sorry, I'm getting all emotional now. There's such a sacred plant. It's, there's thousands of years of, of history, of human history and cultural relevance. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And people can, the people that harvest it and live with the trees are such beautiful people that I think we, this, it's not an option. We don't have option. Creating, making your fragrances more sustainable isn't an option. If we want to live, if we want our planet to thrive, if we want other people to thrive, then that's what we have to do. That's just, so I hope, I hope that you visit sustainableperfumery.org and join us um, in whatever form that takes, even if it's just downloading our little endangered species sheet or listening to one of our talks um, with a professional, um, with a professional environmentalist um, rather than an amateur one here ranting at you. I apologize for the rant. Um, but anyway, we can have a better world. I think that if we can understand how prayers and spells and candles weave themselves together to create you know, magical objects, we can look within ourselves and within our world and perceive those threads of capitalism, of white supremacy, of colonialism that have made themselves such poisonous integral parts of our ways of being. We have to, for the sake of people who've always deserved better and for the sake of the plant species that depend, on which arts depend. And that's how I'm going to end it really dramatically. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mauricio. Um, we, there's quite a few comments and questions. And uh, I just like to just take a moment to allow it to sink in. Um, that's okay. not how I thought it was going to go, by the way. But that's what I guess was the plan. Hey, like, how can you talk about these topics without yeah. it going there? You know, really? <laughs> I mean, so. well, the topic went there, but the like, I. I practiced it so many times, but I didn't get this emotional in, in those practices. Yeah, it's always different when you're, when you're actually inhabiting it, I think. Um, uh, actually, and to, touching a little bit on Mauricio, so one topic quickly before we go to everyone, because, hey, I can. Um, I, I uh, years ago, bought a perfume from Mauricio called Demonica, and it was, uh, you know, I'll save the stories for a beer, um, but... Um, I recently went to check on it on his website and I noticed that he stopped producing it because it was no longer being produced in a way that he felt was sustainable. So I, I just would applaud the fact that um, it's one thing that, to talk about sustainability and it's another thing to stop production when it warrants production stopping. So I want to just applaud you for that. 
Thank you. Um, we are, we, it's a really tough um, decision to make because I, frankincense was an ingredient in Demonica. And so um, I just explained why I wouldn't uh, work with frankincense. Um, but those people, people still need that. They still need us to buy frankincense. They still need our money to survive as long as this world is what it is, right? So how do we find a sustainable frankincense? Well, we hunt down a scientist that um, specializes in frankincense sustainability. Um, we'll actually be releasing our conversation with her very soon. And then, you know, then uh, we work with farmers. We work with the current suppliers um, here in the States, here in California. Um, I, Perfumer's Apprentice is a partner of ours and we're so excited to just even be able to put information on a website that everyone, almost, well, not everyone, but almost everyone looks at. Um, and so I don't think ultimately it's a, it's a stopping is not necessarily the solution. It's a temporary kind of thing where I'm like, okay, like, is that, I know where, what's going on with this. Do I want to put that energy into my product? Given what I do, no. Well, I mean, a temporary stoppage. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's sort of what I what I felt personally when 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 confronted with the Black Lives Matter movement, where you just have to stop and pause and actually think about what you're doing, you know, versus re replying. Or, you know, you know what I mean. So, I mean, a temporary stoppage is is, a, is an act in and of itself. I think so. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, uh, okay. So let's get to the questions. So, um, Therese Western um, asks. Uh, uh, Marie, Therese, I'll just read it out. Unless you want to go on screen, it's up to you, but it might be just in the interest of time. Uh, Therese Western asks, hey, Mauricio, what's your definition of witchcraft? Ooh, as opposed to my I class one. Actually, my class one is really similar, but uh, as to my personal one, but I would say that, I mean, essentially it is the application of skill and knowledge to create something that for me, I think should be beautiful, but it's a creation of something with intention, right? So we are working with spirits, whatever the spirits that we work with look like, or well, I guess you can't necessarily always see them, but what they are like. Um, and deciding that while it is very real for your divinities or your spirits to pull things in specific directions for you, you also have the ability to commune with these spirits directly yourself. We can commune with Jasmine, with Rose, and sometimes they're like, go away, but other times they're like, oh, you're, you know, you're paying attention to me, you're leaving me offerings, you're giving me things, you're, you want to learn from me. Um, so for me, that learning and the application of what it is that you learn about how it is that you are able to shape your reality is a form of witchcraft, but I, I'm not an authority to define what witchcraft is at all. For anyone. That's whole point. Um, what do you mean by that's the whole point? Uh, well, uh, the witch, I suppose, is essentially a rebellious thing, right? You are, at least at this, this point in time. Um, before, that was very different, but also they might not have called themselves witches, right? We're using a very specific word, as opposed to like spirit worker or, you know, a medicine person. Um, I'm not any of those things, and I uh would not i was not raised in a way that make would for me make it okay to uh pull in something that is m perhaps more indigenous or um more uh culturally specific to someone that exists in a culture i don't exist in okay um <clears throat> carl do you have a question before we move on to the other two in the community or do you want to Was that me? Oh, no, 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 Clara. Oh, 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 I was like, did I not hear something? No. Um, no, I think I, thanks Mauricio. The talk was amazing. Um, I think I have to process actually all the information. Yes, I'm sorry, I do that with <laughs> No, it's, um, it was amazing, yeah. Well, it really, it really kept me thinking, like I, I, I actually also could Pay more attention in my practice when I use certain materials, like where are they coming from? And yeah, I, I sometimes think it would be so interesting that um, everyone who, who uses uh, 
natural materials would be able to travel to the places where the materials are growing and see how is that processed and uh, and talk to the people who who are working and living in that uh, in those lands yeah yeah and not possible for us right now Clara <laughs> no um, <laughs> but it's good to at least learn about it right this information yeah. while it's very obscure is available in in at least uh, at academic ways, right? We can go to the uh, IUCN Red Lists website and are, oh, is vanilla endangered? Oh, we can. Why is that? And we, I mean, we can look at the history of Madagascar. We can look at the history of the people of Madagascar. We can look at the history of this botanical species. Um, actually, the only, I'll go ahead and say this as of right, that I know of, uh, that the only species of vanilla that is not categorized by the Red List, so that's not to say that it's not endangered, is Tahitian vanilla. Um, and I believe John Steele, who was uh, who uh, was mentioned earlier, I believe he has one on Perfumer's Apprentice. Last I checked, in Olio Resin, the things I remember. I don't know. Um, John Steele's spirit is always with us, somewhere. <laughs> yes, he's always somewhere, especially when it comes to naturals. Um, one, and actually, thank you for. I apologize for not including this in like the main talk, but one of the things that I kind of my just talked over was. Um, I don't believe that this is only applicable in natural mediums. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, fig, fig is a really cool uh, tree and plant with a lot of folklore, um, including that if you have a fig tree in your, on your, you know, near your home and it likes you, it'll absorb curses and evil eyes and then send them to the people you don't like, but that's only if it likes you. Um, so, you know, we can do reconstructions of figs. I think reconstructions are essential to the sustainability of perfumery. Um, so sustainable reconstructions of endangered materials, um, but also, you know, reconstructing, you know, making fog. We can't, we can't necessarily, we can tincture fog and people have, but it's not this necessarily the same as being able to wear something that has a fog report. Okay, let's, uh, uh, refuse here. <laughs> I will get that one day, Nam. <laughs> and wants to know, is a friend uh, available? Are you, or no, are you it was, my plan was to release it Oh, it was gonna be so much fun. Uh, was to release it at a kind of like a little Halloween party at Tiger Lily, um, which may still happen, but I don't think it's gonna happen. Nah. <laughs> I mean, unless like you know, not at this rate. Yeah, yeah, it's not gonna happen. Um, so okay. sorry, that's not an answer. Um, I think I would still like to release it around then, um, mostly because. Well, the timing, the timing is appropriate, but also we're, every day we're learning something through the COSP and the people we're talking about. And so if there's, you know, an, op an opportunity for me to utilize or for, my, for me to utilize a sustainable, more sustainable um, material uh, in the uh, product creation, then I would like to do that. Uh, and by the way, quick quick shout out. I know Heather, Molly, and Sydney are on this. Uh, oh, are they? I, I see them. Yeah, I see them active. I think it's the same Heather, Molly, Molly and Sydney. But um, hey, hey guys. So okay, so Jazz has a quick question. Uh, well, I don't know, quick. But do you feel internet culture has influenced the interpretation of olfactory symbolism in witchcraft? In other words, are there emerging forms of techno mysticism from forums and groups over the year that are driving new meaning? Ooh, that's a really good question. I I wish I I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, more so the second part. The first part I do have an answer to. But um, the so in some ways scent is less. Um, it's, I, I'm going to just go ahead and use the word important. It seems to be less important in this digital witchcraft culture, because you can't smell the things. The, sm the smoke that you see coming from the incense or from the cauldron or from the fire is visual. Um, and so you're seeing it as a visual thing. You're not experiencing it as uh, an inhalation or a smell. Um, and I think that I've, or I know I have seen people who don't necessarily do much ritual in their, you know, per on their personal time, but have come to things or even, you know, even visited um, altars that, um, public altars that have been created late, um, lately. Different people have done um, altars at different demonstrations, which have been beautiful and watching people either dance or 
cry or meditate in front of them is always extremely powerful. And so that's, you see that shift where they smell the flowers, they smell the smoke, they smell the incense. And I think that in a way has, the internet has opened up people more to, opened up people more to these, these different concepts of spirituality. Um, and then when they are, get to experience them, they're almost even more intense than they would be for someone that is used to them, right? Um, and secondly, um, the, uh, it's really cool to uh, be able to actually purchase incense from other practitioners. So that's a thing that's happening, right? There's all kinds of really talented herbalists and perfumers and people that are somewhere in between um, that make uh, that make product that it, that is available that's available for you to purchase right over the internet. And so you can then experience the ritual and the magic of people that um, you you know you would not necessarily have met should you know if social media didn't exist, you wouldn't know about what they were doing and you wouldn't you certainly wouldn't be able to buy it as easily as you know you can now. You just, just Apple Pay and someone looks at your phone and looks at all the stuff and then here it is on its way. Um, and yeah, so it's a kind of a little bit of a, a, it's not, I don't think it's a negative thing at all. I just think that more people are learning about what can be done or what is done. And that means that they, there is less reference for, you know, people have fewer references. Thanks, Mauricio. And then the last question before we move on to Mr. Elliot, who I see in front of the Northern Lights over there. Um, the last question is from James. Uh, and James, who is speaking tomorrow, everybody, um, asks, do you incorporate spirit vessels into scented jewelry? If so, can you give us an example of what they would look like? Thanks. That is really cool. Uh, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't so much work um, with jewelry very much. However, I kind of see it as being, I mean, it really seems to me to be a very like, very ripe opportunity and fun opportunity to explore like talismanic magic where you know we carry this object that smells that has been designed to smell a specific way or to contain a spirit in a you know fragrant vessel and maybe you don't smell the scent that it's contained in but it, you know it's there and it is there um, and that scent or that vessel is used to give that spirit direction um, or give you know give whatever give intention to the spirit um, or feed intention to the spirit or feed the spirit and keep it alive um, or keep it active anyway um it, there's all kinds of potential in that how fun um i'm imagining like mandy's like little lockets and you know filled with like a protective charm or um some kind of you know amorous blend or really or you know really anything you can think of i think mandy in fact has recently released um three little felty pomanders oh, yeah. they're, they're like yeah, which... they're so perfect and mandy and like yeah Compact and beautiful, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if they're intended as magical objects, but they're certainly referencing sort oh, of- um, that's, what she, that's what she does. Association, with yeah, with plagues. Yeah. And, um, yeah. All right, Mauricio, uh, as always, a super pleasure to hear you speaking. And um, so, so we've put the website a couple times in the chat, but just one last time, I'm gonna pop it in one more time. Um, Coalition for Sustainable Perfumery and uh, Molly, Heather, and Sydney are, are, are in, the, in the community here. So definitely, um, these guys are the real deal. You know, definitely check it out. It's, it's, if we all get behind it, um, it has a, a bigger chance of succeeding and we want this to succeed. So, all right, Mauricio, thank you. Thank you both very much. Thank you. For your time.